The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. <laughs> All right, so we have Bill McDonough and Paul Williams from the seminal rock band Australian Crawl on the lineup today. Bill and Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Exciting to be here, mm. actually. And we were just talking about this is your very first podcast, right? For yeah. me, it is. Yeah, what about yeah, you, Yeah, same Bill? for me. Yeah. We're old. Quite, quite. <laughs> Been quite listening a lot to a few. Yeah, though. that's good. Good, Thank good, you. good. Well, we'll start with the basics. You know, how are you guys doing today? Where are you today? And and who are you with, Bill? Why don't Why don't we start with you? Uh, I'm at home, which is on the Mornington Peninsula, where uh, I grew up. I've got a farm down here, and it's cold and drizzly. Typical Victorian pre-winter weather. W- what kind of farm do you got? What do you grow there? Uh, we've raise? got. We've got uh, sport horses and cattle. It's not very big. It's about 40 acres. Yeah, 40 acres. And Paul, how about yourself? Where are you today and and who are you hanging with? Okay. um, The other other end of Australia, the far north, tropic north, inside the Barrier Reef, if you know northern Queensland, there's Cairns right at the top. Well, not nearly, yeah, nearly the top. And we're up in the rainforest about. 20 k's northwest of Cairns. Yeah, right. And how long have you and been up there for? Yeah. Um, since 2014, so that's a few years. Um, yeah. My dad originally moved up here, so we followed him up. He's not so well these days, so we're hanging close with him. Yeah. Well, you got out of the cold anyway. It's nice and hot up there. Well, it's cool. I got my long pants on today and a hoodie, but um, it's cool now. It's a nice winter because we're up, we're up in the altitude. Oh, okay, yeah. We're up the, the hill. And so it's a lot cooler than Cairns. It's nice. You get the win- you get your you know your winters as or well. seasonal. The crocodiles can't make it up that high either. I'd imagine. I've heard rumours they <laughs> they can. They come from the other side through the water systems. No, there's been some sightings in the freshwater rivers up here. Yeah, yeah geez, it's all part <laughs> of the beauty and splendour of Australia, I suppose. The um, you know when the opportunity came across our desk to have a conversation, um, you know, I personally got really really excited because. Um, despite being half Australian, my mom's Australian, I I was only exposed to your music relatively late in life, which, which seems somewhat criminal. And, and as I'm sure we'll kind of talk about it, it came through surfing because in 2017, a surf filmmaker, Kai Neville released uh, cluster, which featured uh, the free surfing virtuosos of the then moment, you know, your Dane Reynolds and your Creed McTaggart's your Ryan Callanan's. And there was a show stopping performance from the gold coasts, Jack Freestone, cut to Australian Crawls as Reckless. And the song is incredible, but it was such a departure from the rest of the Cluster soundtrack and really, you know, kind of all surf videos at the time that it was immediately arresting and, and personally sent me down that rabbit hole of becoming a fan. So I suppose I have, um, you know, Kai Neville and Jack Freestone to thank for that. And I thought that might be kind of a good jumping off point today because Australian Crawl throughout your run in the 1980s and certainly through the prism of history were heavily associated with quote unquote surf music. And I was wondering if that was a deliberate goal of the band when you started out. So, you know, Bill or Paul, you you tackle that question to get started here. Well, Bill, you you lived on the uh, peninsula. Mm. You can start that one off. (laughs) Well, by default, yes, because that was the culture. We were young guys at school in the 1960s when this whole surf thing was kicking off. And, um, you know, Melbourne and the Mornington Peninsula were coming out of the 50s, the the very sort of restricted 50s after after World War II. And, of course, the 60s hit, everything was happening, music, fashion and surfing. And I, I think it was the late fifties, wasn't it, when the when the Americans brought the first boards to Australia. Um, so it was all part of that new culture that any young guy, if he wanted to be hip and cool, wanted to embrace. You know, you wanted to play rock and roll, be in a rock and roll band. You wanted to be a surfer, particularly for our group, because we grew up 
at a place called Mount Eliza, which is on one of the bayside uh, beaches of um, of the peninsula. So you've got two bays. You've got Western Port Bay on the east. You've got Port Phillip Bay on the west. And down on the south, you've got the Bass Coast surf beaches. So it was just natural for us to be sort of ch- channeled towards surfing. And, and- yeah, what I noticed about these guys when I met them, because I'm a suburban boy, uh, what I noticed about was that they all had seemed to have blonde hair <laughs> And they'd been in the water a lot. We used to call them seaweed suckers, you know. <laughs> but I, my, I had this, I don't know, brown curly hair. I used to love surfing, but but all the boys down south always seemed to have like the the blonde surf bleach. Yeah, we hair. did. Yeah, well, we had the blonde hair, blue eyes, all of us, even Brad. And um, yeah. yeah, so um, and you know, like we grew up from little kids sailing and motorboating skin diving, you know, and water skiing. And we're all champion swimmers at school, so we're real, you know, we were real water boys, all of us. Yeah, and I was going to... Champions, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that somewhat revisionist, Paul? Yeah, no, 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 did you know, Paul? Um, no, no, you know, um, Guy was a... He's going to bring out the medals in there. <laughs> I was a school champion, but Guy was a Victorian schoolboy champ. Oh, yeah, wow. He was also, I never yeah, knew that. Yeah. Yeah, he he uh, <laughs> won the Victorian his relay team won the Victorian Victorian one hundred meters freestyle relay. Awesome! Mm. Yes. Mm. So so what came first for you guys? I, I'd imagine it was was maybe surfing because it was probably a derivative of sport. But but I'm curious, was it surfing came before music or or was it the other way around? Uh, it was surfing really? Yeah, that started mm. as soon as we could get wheels. Bit. A bit like uh, because where we lived, you couldn't get to the surf if you're a teenager unless your mum drove you down there, you know. And um, so as soon as we got wheels, um, the whole surf thing started. So that's around about, say, 17, 18. And mm-hmm. that meant you also could drink. You know, you could go to the hotels. Drinking age was 18 here in Australia in Victoria. So, But my brother used to sneak in underage because that was the sort of guy he was. And there was a big surf scene at the local pubs too. You know, like there'd be the surf bar where all the surfy guys would hang out. So, um, you know, you wanted to congregate with that sort of cool scene and then surfing went from that. I mean, even the dress was, um, you know, there was a certain dress code, you know. The, lot, yeah, oh, the yeah. long blonde hair, flannel shirt. Hang 10, yeah, yeah hang 10 yeah, T-shirts. Yeah. Remember the yeah. hang 10? Yeah, with the little two little yeah. feet. And, and was that, for, for listeners, can you describe what the, the Mornington Peninsula was like in Victoria, I guess, during that era too? Was, was surfing perceived as, as very counterculture? Was it, was it kind of a conservative society that you, you guys are sort of rebelling against by kind of taking it up? What was it like? Well, yeah, you're right because, I mean, the whole surf scene, when you look at it, was counterculture. It was rebellious. And that was part of the, the attraction, don't you reckon, Paul? Yeah. Absolutely, it was part of the part of the escape for me, the big escape from being up there in the suburbs. Yeah, as soon as I got a car, it was like get down and just surf and just get away from normal that average sort of mm. life. Yeah, the music was the escape yeah. for me too. It just made it the two and yeah. girls. Yeah, exactly. Well, surfing and girls mm. sort of went hand in hand. You know. Oh yeah. So it was a positive to be a surfer. I can tell you. Mm. But you know. There was a conservative <laughs> side to the whole um, surf scene prior to surfing, of course, which came in the late fifties and early sixties. Um, it might have there might have been some people introducing it slightly earlier than that from the states, but see, it, it was the surf um, life saving clubs that were predominant on the beaches in Australia, and they were conservative. Mm. And they were, you know, run by the older generation and, you know, you had the short hair, the cap, the onesie swimsuit and you're up and down the beach, you know, with your reels and paddling boards and rowing boats and it was uncool. Uh, And the surfers were sort of rebelling against that more conservative approach to, you know, surf culture, which was the clubbies. And what about for both of you, you know, your home lives? Like, 
was there sort of any pressure from your parents to kind of follow a more conservative trajectory and and not surf and not play music and or, or were they fairly supportive which i suppose if they were would have been a little bit of an outlier to, to the broader society at the time i i don't know um i don't know speaking for bill but for myself um once i got a car it was two hours to the surf for me um my week my friday night was was gone going down to the surf and or going to parties, then going to the surf at midnight, going through the mist and the fog to get down to the south coast um, and wake up there by the water and then just get out first thing. Um, no, I didn't care what my mum thought I'd, at all, really. It was just what I wanted to do. I had that mum gave me that freedom, I suppose. And it was, she encouraged me to play music and to go and surf, I guess. She didn't really worry about it. I think she's pleased to see me go out the, on the weekends. Mm. Mm. <laughs> It wasn't long after that I got out in my own house, yeah. Um, well, I was in a different situation. I had the misfortune of um, losing my father at a very young age. Dad died at 37 from mm. cancer and Guy was only nine and I was 12. So mum brought us up and um, I suppose because she was probably a little bit more... Um, flexible than maybe dad would have been if he'd lived. Um, yeah, I lo our lives changed completely. Who knows? I reckon if dad had lived, maybe there'd be no Australian crawl because Guy and I wouldn't have gone into rock and roll. I think, you know, who knows? I think he may have steered me away from rock and roll and, and surfing. It's interesting too, because it, it's such a common through line for a lot of people in surfing where the ocean in a lot of ways becomes a surrogate parent, you know, or becomes sort of, as I think Paul put it, you know, an escape from, from what you would have been doing otherwise. And um, it, it sounds like it was obviously similar for both of you, even though, as, as Paul said, it, it, his, you know, his mother was fairly supportive. Yeah. Well, mum was really supportive. Um, you know, Guy, my late brother, who was a star in the band, he, um, he was a bit of a rebel. I, I was the more conservative uh, being the older brother, I, I sort of had to step in when Dad died. But Guy was a bit of a tearaway, and so he'd be hanging out with older guys, and they'd be uh, they'd be getting into cars and heading down to the surf and going to the pubs and drinking underage. He was a bit of a naughty boy, my brother. <laughs> my mother tolerated it. Mm. And the pivot to music. Now, 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 give me the story on the genesis of you guys getting together and deciding. Well. We want to play music together. How did that come about? Well, Spiff Rouch, the band that Bill was in with Guy, was with, with James. Was, yeah. yeah, James was singing in that. He was a singer in Australian Crawl. Um, uh, you were on drums. Rob was on bass. Mm. I met them. They, Rob was going to leave and go back to civil engineering, wasn't he? Yeah. And then so I was in for a minute, then out for a minute because he came yeah. back. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Spiff Rouch was basically the same lineup as Australian Crawl, if you count Paul's, mm. you know, very quick in mm. and out. You did a gig, though. <laughs> yeah. You did a couple of gigs, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple, yeah, Tiger Land mm. and stuff in the town. Yeah, yeah, so that was like Australian Crawl version one. And that mm. was a band that uh, was, you know, basically pro. We were working all the clubs and pubs in Melbourne. And it was all original, all original stuff too. Yeah. You, you guy, James, you're all writing. That's why I was attracted when you came mm. to my place with the tape. It was like the odd when Simon was playing lead guitar mm. then. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Was Simon, Simon? Yeah, 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 Pinky. Mm. Yeah, and it was the ultimate. It was like, wow, they've got a great lead singer, great lead guitarist. You guys are so organised. Yes, I want, yeah. I want in. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, yeah. that broke apart. But then we all sort of got back together again mm. in the end, as Australian Crawl. Um, you went your ways, didn't you? Like um, some of the boys finished uni, travelled a bit. You guys went on the boats yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And mm. then Guy had the flatheads in between, which mm. was another group that he was in. And what when you guys got together to start playing music, um, you know, with Spiff Roach and then later with Australian Crawl, was there a deliberate goal at the outset? Did you just like playing music? Was it, we, we all, if someone can pay us to do this, it seems like a good lifestyle. We want to be rich and famous. We want to break internationally. Was, was there any of that or were you just kind of getting together to play? 
Well, it's like any any band. You just you love playing and you're attracted to each other. It's like girlfriends or something, yeah. isn't it, Bill? Something mm. like that. But you enjoy playing together. You enjoy. For me, it was like being in a band that writes their own songs that had the right flavors, and it was so. Um, some of the songs were about surfing and surf culture. Mm. James was very good with his writing, his lyrics like that. He was always contemporary, mm. like that. Um, there was a. It was just. I always wanted to be in a band anyway since I was six. Mm. My dad was in a band. I used to sit under his drums, under his drums when I was little. So it was just in my mm. blood. Obviously, with Bill and Guy too. I mean, you just want to do it, and when you find the right guys to be with, you just go for it. There was no plan with us, was it? It was like. But a momentum happened, mm. you know. A momentum actually started to happen. Some people, we started off by um, when James's brother David was playing drums before Bill came in this, into the, when we recorded their first album. So um, we were doing gigs uh, down the peninsula and just hiring our own halls. And I was doing the printing for the posters. And we'd get like hundreds of people on the, yeah. wouldn't we? Like um, mainly surfy, surf mm. people. They just dug what we were doing. Like Bill and Guy, he'll probably tell you this one about that. Tell them about the Royal Hotel. Yeah, well, we um, Mornington. after the sort of um, falling out that... This is Australian Crawl's yeah, first gig. After the falling out of, of uh, Spiff Rouch, um, the guys had... Guy and I had gone off and we had another band called the Flatheads. And Paul was playing with James and Simon and it was the beginning and Brad, Brad. and David Rain was on drums yeah. and that was the beginning of Australian Crawl but they hadn't actually named themselves Australian Crawl and um, Guy and I had this old flea pit of a pub down <laughs> on the coast in Mornington and we convinced the old uh, <laughs> the guy who owned the pub to set up a bit of a venue there and he was terribly conservative and uh, anyway we, we decided we'd get this gig happening so we booked... <laughs> We booked Australian Crawl. I think you were called Clutch Cargo for that gig. And, yeah, yeah. and of course, they invited every man and, and his dog that they knew. Joint was packed. Guy and I made an absolute squillion. And the band, the band <laughs> went, went off. What? We got no, nothing. We paid you a pittance. Uh, yeah. And the band. Yeah, we went nuts. Yeah, and the band went yeah, off. We did. Absolutely off. We, we, <laughs> we did 10 songs. We only knew 10 songs. And then they were, we went back behind the stage and the crowd was just, the pub was just going to fall off its foundations. Everybody's just jumping. And we looked out and there's people jumping up and down on tables. The bar was being smashed. So the. <laughs> we had to play again, so we just played ten, the ten songs again. Yeah. And the publican, who was a, who also, he also <laughs> ran a bus company. He was one ran the local bus bus company. He was apoplectic with rage. You know, there was it was soup dripping off the walls. His furniture was rooted. It was just mayhem. So that it was good. It was a huge gig. It was a good sign. Good sign for yeah, the band. That's yeah. a gr- that's not a great bus, sign. I, I, I do want to come back to this original night, but but first, either Bill or Paul, I I understand Australian crawls. You know, you guys were on the swim team, and that's obviously a stroke. What does Spiff Rouch mean, and where did that come from? Ah, yeah, I've got this right. Well, Spiff. <laughs> there were two versions of Spiff Rouch. See, before Australian <laughs> crawl. Um, I mean, everything. Th- everyone thinks Australian Crawl just came out of the blue. It didn't. You know, Paul had been playing music for a long, long time. He'd been in numerous bands. Likewise with the other guys, like Guy and I started playing in 1972, 73 with our first serious bands. And that first serious band was a band called Spiff Rouch and the Untouchables, which was just a, like an art house band. It did about maybe 12 gigs and then it sort of, disappeared because it was too bohemian to be successful. And then in 75, we resurrected um, the name Spiff Rouch, but the name came from the original band and we all had characters in that band and each character had a costume. I mean, it was a bit like um, if you've ever seen a band called Skyhooks, which was a big Australian um, band, and... Yeah, yeah. As Split Ends was another one, a New Zealand band. That was the sort of thing, you know, you had a, a persona. It was very theatrical. 
And the, the lead guitarist was a guy called Mark Williams and he, his persona was Spiff Rouch. And the way we got the name is he got so drunk one night on a bottle of whiskey, he was lying on the floor repeating Cliff Richards. He was going, Cliff Richards, Cliff Richards, Cliff Richards, Cliff Richards. And it came out Spiff Rouch. <laughs> By the end it came out Spiff Rouch. It came Rouch. out Spiff Rouch. So he became like a Cliff Richards parody, but we called him Spiff Rouch. <laughs> and we were the uh, we were the untouchables, and we all had we all Mark, had names. Wasn't names. wasn't Mark um, the co-writer for the first single, but Beautiful People? No, that was uh, that was, was that Mark him? Hudson, who was one of um, Jim's, yeah, one of oh, James's mates. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but Mark Mark wrote some songs, some classic surfy songs uh, for Spiff Rouch, which we used to play. Do you remember playing Wangaratta Bay? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. loaded up the. Yep. How does it go? We loaded up the woodies with yep. the surfboard and the wax. Just a few beach dollies. Nana, 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 nana. Uh, board shots, <laughs> bikinis to match. Yeah, so there's a lot of surfy songs Touring right from the very go. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. So, so circling back to that opening opening night when you destroyed the pub. W- what year is that again, Bill? Oh, that oh. was. Um, I was in I was in loose trousers. 79, 78? I was in seventy eight, nineteen seventy eight. So, yeah. Mm. Okay. And it, it does the, the way you articulate it. It does very much feel like a, a lightning in a bottle kind of moment with Australian crawl and, and maybe with the songs and with the the chemistry between the band members. What would you kind of if you had to look back, like what was what was what was it about all that 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 made it kind of work in a way that maybe Spiff Rouch uh, didn't. Oh, pretty faces. <laughs> it was, you know, yeah. it, it's funny. In, increased aesthetic. <laughs> Look, I just think we, you know, I think the reason why Spiff Rouch didn't work was because Paul and Simon didn't want to pursue that. They were probably a bit too young, immature, and they wanted to go off and thanks do some touring. No, no, um, no did I say Paul? I, 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 Jay, no, sorry, yeah. James and si- James, James and Simon. Not Paul. Yeah, yeah. No, no. They did. They went Sorry, Paul. Yeah. They went, I'm they getting went, old. I am 68. Right. Uh, um, yeah, James yeah. and Simon sort of broke that band up because they wanted to go off and do other things. They just weren't quite ready. So I think when the timing happened for Australian Crawl, um, it was just the right guys at the right time at the right place. Just one of those things, you know. Mm. It, 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 was, it, it, it didn't um, – we couldn't work out what it was that, that happened for us. We just felt the momentum coming because people were coming at us. They liked the songs. They liked the band's persona. Mm. Um, and it, it attracted people, uh, didn't it, mm. Bill? It, it just did. Mm. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it just seemed to be – it was very of the time, Bill, yeah. wasn't it? And um, we weren't – the most of the fashionable bands in Melbourne and Sydney were very inner city. Mm. And I think we were probably a very refreshing change and we reflected um, – a lot of a majority of people say who were fans and that were had an Australian feel, mm. like the mm. classic beaches, bikinis, um, mm. you know, being by the by the beach and that casual lifestyle. I think mm. it wasn't deliberate, was it? No. Australian crawl was a swimming thing, you know. But we, you know, we we sort of tried to be inner city actually once we, because there was this sort of like you have to conform with the band fashion and mm. struct, social structure yeah. as well. Uh, and it was sort of tough for us, mm. wasn't it, Bill? Like initially breaking into mm. the gigs, um, supporting a lot of the bands that we mm. loved that treated us like shit. It was like a really weird situation because we were genuine outsiders mm. to the, the Australian music yeah, scene. Yeah, because we were well, different. Who, who um, would be some of those? Be- yeah, but who would be some of those? Well, you have to name them if you don't want to, Paul, but they probably don't give a okay. shit. Who, no. who, would, who well, would have well, been well, some well. of those bands and when you say treated you like shit, like what would they kind of do? Road crews sort of, mm. wouldn't they, Bill? There'd be um, it's like baptism of fire for a young band that are different. Mm. Um, it's not, it still happens these days. Mm. Um, jealousies, um, who the fuck are you? Where do you come mm. from? You know, how dare you be on this stage with us? Um, petty, it's all petty and it's I'm cooler than you yeah. stuff. You know, and it's you know when you grow up and you go past all that, you go that was all just bullshit anyway. Um, like some of the really, you know, what is cool? Only Miles Davis is cool, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> some of the um, like some of the big bands when we were that we were supporting were like Jojo Zepp and the Falcons, and uh, I wasn't going to name sports. anybody. <laughs> okay, sports. yeah, and they were yeah. inner city cool. We weren't. We're just a whole lot of hicks from the Morton Peninsula, surfy dudes. You know, you, you, yeah. you, they just wouldn't, they wouldn't you. take us seriously. <laughs> they just thought we were lightweight. But that, that gave us strength, yeah, though, it didn't did, it, Bill? Yeah, it really it did. did. We, were, we just were grit our teeth and go, well, <laughs> fuck you guys, we'll show exactly. you. And all the time we just had that, it was a good thing to happen to us. It did, they, we didn't let the bastards grind us down. I've got to tell you this story. I'll just tell you quickly this story. You on, know, Bill, yeah, of course. Um, you know, after Spiff Rouch broke up and Australian Crawl started to really get a hold on the inner scene in Melbourne, I was playing in a band called Loose Trousers and we played a gig together at the Swinburne University. And my, I yeah, remember it. my band was the headline, okay? So I was, the, yeah, right. I was there and I saw yeah. the Crawl play and it's the first time I've seen the band in a long time because they'd had this meteoric rise, you know, they'd quickly come together, quickly, you know, got some support and some, some you know, heavyweights behind them and they'd been rehearsing and now they were playing, playing, playing and they were improving at such a rapid rate. And, and James Rain, the lead singer, was writing these really cool songs, you know, really cool songs that were very um, Australian, and I just stood there and I just watched their set and I just went, wow, <laughs> these guys are going to absolutely kill it. They're going to kick ass to the point where I went back to my uh, my guys in loose trousers and said, oh, guys, we're going to have to make some changes. I mean, did you see that set? You know, and uh, anyway, yeah, I left Loose Trousers and joined, went, got, got back with Australian Crawl because Loose Trousers was going nowhere, man. <laughs> Again, when compared to the Crawl, they were just going to be a rocket. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've often found observedly that there seem to be a lot of parallels between, you know, having a profession in the music world, having a profession in the surfing world. Uh, it, they both involve a level of talent and artistry there's sort of this alchemy that happens between creativity and commerce there's often a, a matriculation process wherein you start to get better locally and then regionally and then nationally and then hopefully internationally and then there's this touring aspect to it do, do you think that's sort of a fair a parallel mm. when you kind of look at both both places mm. absolutely yeah yep in many ways but i think for surfers it's um bit more isolated unless you've got a nice group of friends and management agents around you um if you're in a band you've got a we felt like we were a bunch of little pirates going around the town you know it was a gang mm. of us so you feel a bit stronger mm. i think for surfers when they've got to put that pressure on themselves mm. if they do or if they don't um I, and the randomness of waves that's another <laughs> awesome thing to contend with in contests you know um it's, it's, there are similar goals and similar things to be achieved, but I think there's more isolation for a surfer, I think. Mm. I'm, I've never been a pro surfer, so, but that's how it looks to me. Mm. Yeah, we were a gang. <laughs> mm. Yeah. and you, you do see that on tour as, as well, you know. I mean, I think you're totally right, Paul. It is obviously more individualistic, but, but those individuals then congregate together and, and historically throughout the sport's sort of 40-odd-year history – the Australians in particular have been a very strong unit. Um, and in recent years, you've seen a very strong unit out of Brazil, et cetera. But mm. same thing, you know, and I, and I think there's sort of, yep. you end up becoming a product of your environment. And, and Australian Crawl um, had its tenure kind of late 70s through the 80s. Um, similarly with the surfing world, like that was just a very unique time. You know, when I talked to individuals from back then that it was, it was very wild west in the surfing world. I'm wondering if it was similar experience for you guys uh, touring through Australia and, and, and internationally. Absolutely. There was no telephones. I mean, there was no mobile mm -hmm. phones or computers or mm -hmm. internet. I don't know how we did all that, Bill, do you now? No, Looking no. Back, it's, with, with, the, with the dyslexic road to, to a manager. And, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, mm. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. It's funny. Um, <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? Yeah. Well, why well, is it so much a question? I just, I just think, 
I, yeah. I've always <laughs> felt like it's, I mean, even when I started, I've been working at the company, not doing this, but for 15 years. And mm. it was considerably more Wild West when I started in 2006 compared to now. I can only imagine what it was like in the 80s. And, oh, yeah. And, and it, it's a lot of like, oh, you you thrust out into the world to kind of cleave your own way through it in a lot of ways. Yeah, certainly unregulated, that's for sure. <laughs> and no, I mean, we all just wanted to say, yeah, where do we sign? Where do we <laughs> sign? Right. Sure. You know, and you're in your early 20s and this is what it's the dream's laid in front of you mm. and everybody's going, this is all yours, boys. You know, you can. But you know what? But you soon learn that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> at, at the time, though, I mean, I suppose it's relative because, you, you know, you look at the technology that was available to us at the time and we embraced it. Do you remember when we got our first Walkmans? Yep. Whoa, you know, and oh, yeah. things like that. Oh, we were so cool. Well, what about that? You know the, the you know those Dave the the first portable cassette battery powered cassette players was four. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But they're yeah, back yeah. in fashion yeah. again. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And you, we got the pressman. I had the pressman with the mics in the front, so you could just go around recording every, the jams, <laughs> uh, record anything. It was mm. great. But yeah, on the plane we thought it was so cool, yeah, yeah. didn't we? We thought this is. Do you know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> I've got the walk and so. rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> uh, last night I was just doing vodka. <laughs> last night I was just doing a little bit of research, and I was looking up um, about you know some of the early um, you know great surfers out of this country that I remembered, mm. and um, and I was looking at a photo of um, I think it was bloody Wayne Lynch or Bob McTavish. And he's got mm -hmm. a, like a 1948 Holden and he's at Noosa. And we weren't far behind that, mate, were we? I mean, we were going up and down the coast in no, our clapped out and, surf wagons, yeah. you know, the guy's old EH, EH wagon. Well, like, yeah, wagon. I, yeah, I had, a, I had it too, the old shagging wagon with the roof yeah. racks on. and Yeah, but like Paul said, no mobile because... phones. <laughs> and, you know, like, yeah. um, we, like we just hit the road and off we go. Yeah. yeah, like uh, the first, very first Australian crawl tour, um, we had the the Rod Matheson, the sound guy. We just got, we did a a cassette recording of the band, and then he went off on his motorbike and headed up the Australian coast, up the east coast, and or, we said go and organise some gigs. And he came back about a month later, party, and he yeah he got twelve gigs organised all the way up to Noosa and back, and. Um, and they were all surf orientated gigs, and um, that was the sort of thing. It was just like potluck, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Just go and, go and get some gigs, and then let's go and do them. So we had two combis and a couple of Australian station wagons, and I remember changing clutches and engines and PA stacks, and yeah. on the uh, way at War Hope and which oh yeah. God, yeah, Coffs Harbour played to four friends. <laughs> yeah. That was the very well, early, early days. But by the end, we were a, we were a big yeah. unit. Like we had two semi trailers, two Pantex. Yeah. We had like a six man crew. Yeah. We had thirty five people employed. We were a big band. Well, Paul, our own management. Paul, you you yeah. said it earlier too, where you know. Even with regards to surfing, you know, coming out of suburbia, you're like, I just, I just wanted to go do something that was not that, you know, and surfing in particular felt like mm. not that. And I'd imagine it's the same for music. And that is a theme that comes up in all these conversations. I mean, myself included, where it's like, I joined the WSL because it was like running away to join the circus. It, it was the opposite of my upbringing in suburbia, mm. and it was exciting. And I didn't, I didn't mm -hmm. care if I wasn't mm -hmm. making a million dollars. I just Oh, go out and have an adventure, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the that's where we were all lucky, I guess. It it, it worked for us. We mm. could get out there and do it. Yeah, rock and um, roll was a huge adventure for us, wasn't it, Paul? That's how we yeah, approached absolutely. it. Absolutely. Every every day you wake up to to something new. It was yeah. And we 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 did like to party. And I know surfers do and you know, looking at the mags and stuff. We we're talking about the early Australian surf cultures like Mike Peterson's and Townsend from the 70s that I used to admire um, when it was all single fin and fish-shaped surfboards. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, where was I then? Oh, just the adventure of it all. <laughs> yeah. The adventure, yeah. I mean, I used to buy the surf mags because of that. Like it was like... So I remember buying one and it was the first three guys in Bali and they've got Bali belly and but that didn't deter them. They still found some great waves there, mm. you know. And it was it was surfers that actually 
surfers have got a lot to fucking answer for. Like Noosa wouldn't be the size it was now if it wasn't for a couple of guys like Bill mm. mentioned. They they found the spot and started surfing mm. there and told a few friends, you know, um, Australian crawl's success, say, in one place in Brazil was because a couple of surfers saw us mm. at the Bells Beach um, tournament that we sponsored. Mm. And they and they took our music back. They liked us, and we liked them personally. You know, they loved the music because we played at the um, award night on the Saturday night. Um, so you know, sur- and surfers break new ground um, in many ways like that. Um, you look at surf shops; that's a whole culture that's still being is still strong now. It started in the seventies. Australian surf mm. companies, um, Quicksilver. I've I've, I've some of my mates back then in the early days were like, uh, and friends, and co- um, there was Brian Singer from Rip mm-hmm. Curl, um, a few Quicksilver guys I used to know, the Torquay crew, mm-hmm. you know, from way back. I mean, yeah, it was a, and the surfing max. Um, it's so, uh, there's some, it's so lifestyle now, isn't it? Surfing. Mm, of course. Um, it, it's solid. Like, you're, you you know, you've got to, you're working in it. It's sort of, <laughs> In those days, it was very fledgling. I mean, we only had what we have tracks. What was it? Bill, oh, the other one. Um, I don't know. I can't remember. There's a couple. Um, yeah, Wonder, Wonder Warthog was it a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, those, they're retro now. They're bringing mm, them back. Of course. And you, you mentioned yeah. Bell's Beach, and I definitely want to get to that story because I think that's, that's fantastic. Mm. We're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. And when we come back, we will get into a few more topics. We'll be right back. So, in 1984, Australian Crawl sponsored the Bells Beach Championship Tour event, which, to the best of my knowledge, is the only time that this has ever happened where a musical act has sponsored the world's best surfing in the history of our sport. I need to know the story of how this came to be. So, so Bill or Paul, whoever wants to take this, I, I, you must educate me. Well, Oh, uh, well, wow. it's, it, that's a, t- we were, um, Bill wasn't around then, were you, at that time? No, I'd, um, and, I'd, no, I'd um, left. And I was like, uh, bass playing. And, um, so I can't give you any names of people or connections, actually, because I wasn't in any of the, um, it wasn't party to any of those chats or conversations. Um, it just came, I think it might have been Brad. Brad was the big social powerhouse of the band and he would cong- – he, a lot of people, like he could attract all sorts of people, managing people, agents. Um, it's hard to say how it, how it happened for, from my point of view. I know that we just really wanted to do it. Um, we really liked the idea um, and it didn't matter – you know, like uh, financially or anything, we just wanted to be part of it. It was great. It was a great, another exciting thing to do. And we had the background and it was just, you know, just part of it for us. Um, and the, we wanted to play at the, uh, the, the t- at the tournament end, which is at, at Bells Beach and it was on the presentation night at Torquay. We, we thought that was such a privilege to be part of it as well for us. You know, well, such such an iconic event in Victoria, right? And so it would, it's only fitting that mm. Australian crawl would be associated in some ways. It, it's it's great to hear your version of it, Paul, because I'm sure on the other side, and, and I'm not sure if Rip Curl was involved or not, but it, it would make sense if they were. But sort of the Rip Curl surfing community side, they would have just been in awe that that Australian crawl was involved in this event. Um, so, so were you kind of there all week? Did you take in the contest? Like what, what was kind of your experience throughout that event? Yeah, we, um, oh, we, we were, we were playing gigs, mm-hmm. but we, uh, we got down there for the weekend. Um, I think the presentation night was on a Sunday or, or even a Monday night. I'm not sure, but yeah, we were down there for a couple of days cause we booked, um, a couple of holiday houses like Jan Juck, which is very close to Winky Pop and, and Bells and Torquay. Um, yeah, I remember it's in loving the time. We the band and crew had had a great fun time for the. And I had a mate at Torquay we used to hang with anyway. Every every time I had spare time in it was on Easter when bells was happening, right. the bells yep. tournament. Um, 
uh, Samo, his name was. He had rented a farm. There'd be dudes coming from into that farm for jams. Any surfer that was a muso would, would hear about this going on. We were jamming the on the weekend, the Bells tournament weekend. I remember jamming for 10 hours on the first day, 12 hours the next, 14 hours the next, and there'd be people coming and going. Being a bass player, you're usually the only one, and <laughs> so I was. that's why I was always there playing. <laughs> but such a great crew. I mean, there's a lot of surfers that do play guitar and they're into it just as much as you. And there's no levels or anything like that, no pretensions. You just do it, you know, have fun. Of course. And in point of fact, and, and, and I said 1984, but it was actually the Bells event from the 84, 85 season. So it was March, April of mm. 85. The individual who won that event would end up becoming our three time world champion, Tom Curran. And, and he's a fantastic musician. He plays, you know, drums, he plays guitar and, and all sorts. Didn't know that. There's got to be some link, hasn't there, in the brain in, up here in the chemistry, in your own personal chemistry with that. Like the thing you're talking about, the freedom that, the connection of of, of the freedom of music. Uh, there's one thing about surfing I get. That's why I still surf, and it's a very personal thing. It's a selfish thing. It's I can I can still get a buzz from one day surf, like a, a two hour session, that is like better than drugs, and it can last for the rest of your life. Mm. Whenever you think about it, that one session, or if you get lots of good sessions, it's even better. And it's like music; you disappear in mm. time. You that two hours is when you're playing music as well, mm. isn't it, Bill? Like you do a two hour yeah. set, and it's like fuck. That felt like five yeah. minutes. It was so fun. Can we go back and do yeah. that again? Yeah. You know, and surfing's very much like that. I think there's a connection oh, yeah. there. You know, in the in the primitive brain cells there mm. somewhere. Uh, I'm, well, it's such Maybe. a fantastic point too, and I should mention that Freda Zamba from Florida won the women's event that year as well. But there's so many surfers on tour throughout the ages, but particularly 80s, 90s, early 80s that made time for music, you know, while they're on tour. And I think kind of the point you had before, which is like before cell phones, you've got, you know, you're surfing, you're competing, but then there's all these hours to occupy during the day. And music was sort of a through line for a lot yeah, of them. How cool. Mm. I'm wondering cool, on the Australian yeah. crawl side, did you guys, were you able to maintain and make time for <laughs> the surfing? The opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was hard for me because I wanted to keep surfing. I virtually, uh, and then I wanted to windsurf, but I had to stop windsurfing. Um, no, we would try it like our first tour, like uh, when we got to Noosa, there was 10 to 15 waves at, there. And it was like Dave Rain, the drummer, and I, he was a big surfer too. We went out and it was for my first time. So during the day we got to surf, yeah, and you just try and make time, yeah. But once it becomes, once you're traveling in a band, in the bubble, you can't take surfboards unless you've got really good road cases for them. I used to dream of that, have a really good road case. Yeah. For no, you're not really near the surf. And you know what it's like with conditions. Um, yeah. Well, sure. It's sure, Surely when you're sponsoring the Bells Beach event, they're going to give you some wetsuits and surfboards. They'll clear the lineup for you. You'll get the best. <laughs> way. Come on, man. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were just observers, really. We were just hanging out with the other dudes. There was other things going on. I'm not going to talk about that. But you know. was it was it a good um, show that capped off that event for you guys, though? Well, we yeah, it was fun. Um, can I tell you my a, a classic rock and roll moment? And it was on that night. You can tell me all the classic a, rock and roll moments. We can go for ten hours. You okay. go for it. All right, so we're playing. We're, we're actually filming too. There's a film crew came down, so it was quite exciting. They were filming outside. There was a, a, a fight with police outside at the, at the time. All the con contestants were in there getting wild as well, and um, they're filming it. I had this new base that was carbon fiber, and it had a strap into the center of it, so the base could actually go like this on you instead of having two straps. So I, I, we were rocking around, yeah, 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 yeah. and I turned around and I stood on my lead and then moved, and my the carbon fibre neck went bang into my eyebrow, <laughs> split it open an inch, and then just blood starting pouring down my chest and onto the base and onto my hands. And I'm going, I turned around and James singing, we're still, and I could feel it spurting everywhere. And I said, James, am I bleeding? And he goes, rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you just keep pumping out the blood and keep going. Yeah, this is like the clash. <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to say. Uh, uh, yeah. the, so that's my great memory of that night. Mm. Yeah. That sounds awesome. like a pretty standard Bell's Beach night. <laughs> th th throughout 
you know, the Australian crawls sort of, I guess, sort of the tenure over the, the 70s and 80s, you know, Bill or Paul, well, actually, I want to know from both of you, maybe it's not the same. Is, does, is there one moment or one achievement that resonates as sort of the high watermark for the band for you? You got it. Oh, I don't know. It was such a journey. You know, it started <laughs> It started small and then all of a sudden we just went bang and then we just had to go so fast to keep up with it all. It's all a bit of a blur. I suppose on reflection, the one thing that I'm most proud of, and this happened many years after the band had, you know, ended, was our induction into the ARIA Hall of Fame in 1996. It's not, many, it's not too, too many people in that. It's the Australian Recording Industry Association's Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. For Australia, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But... Um, that is a big one, isn't it? It's a, 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 a mm. but it's an achievement that you feel very personally. Some of the it? people see. Oh, I've, I've got mine in the lounge room. I make sure people. Yeah, see it. yeah. Know, yeah. Um, but that was like an award <laughs> that happened years after the band finished. But I suppose on you know on reflection, I, I think some of the some of the memories that real. What about um? Yeah, yeah the, the my music bowl gigs. The, yeah, music the, bowl, my music yeah. bowl. There you go. Hundred thousand. Yeah. Walked out on stage, hundred thousand, yeah. and that was huge. I, I remember yeah. that. that where, that. where was that at again? Sorry, in Melbourne. It's in Melbourne. Yep. And it's in. It's a, called the Melbourne My Music Bowl. It's a like a late fifties built auditorium, outdoor auditorium, amphitheater mm. situation, dug into a into a hill, um, concrete and and steel, um, funnel shaped. Right. My big memory, Bill, was this one when we actually went out, walked out on the stage, and that crowd went mm. nuts. You know what? You know, like a, a funnel is designed for your, the sound from the stage to go out, right, and spread out to the audience. So when the crowd goes nuts and roars and stamps, all that noise comes into you, funneled into you. So you're getting this high pressure. I remember feeling physical pressure from the roaring and stamping when we came out on stage, and I was shaking for – I felt that in my bones, and I, I was shaking for about six songs. Yeah, me think, too. I remember I that snapped. exactly, yeah. Paul. It hit you in the chest. When yeah. 100,000 people roared, yeah. it hit you in the chest, and I was shitting yeah. myself for the first few songs. And In, in fact, yeah, I almost too. lost yeah. it in during Love Boys. I don't know yeah. how I got through Love Boys. I was just on. And that's your I own know, song, dude. I was on automatic pilot. <laughs> And guys looking at guys looking oh, yeah. at me going, "Whoa, come on, Billo, hang in there, yeah, mate." Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's another one. There's another one. It's the same gig, guys. We're we're playing. I'm standing next to guy. It's about three quarters of the way through the set. People start throwing coins at us. What mm -hmm. the fuck would they do that for? Because we don't. We didn't. Mm -hmm. did anyway. They're throwing coins at us. So guy's playing. He turns around and shows me his finger is jammed into his guitar by this coin. The coin's lodged into the wood and his finger's jammed in there too in the wood and he can't move his oh, hand. God. The coins, the cut, fucking coin. And then he's lucky. We're all lucky. What about the time you got that jug thrown and it just missed you? Remember? In oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sutherland. Oh, yeah. my God. But where to stop? Mm. Uh, we had to stop and tell 100,000 people, stop throwing coins at us, mm. please. It's it's hurting yeah. us. It's an so Australian it's form of expression, though, right? I mean, it's mm. a, <laughs> sorry. And we were doing all right. We got limos to that yeah. gig, you know. And, and that's, Paul, that's exciting. Paul reminded me about another gig that I'd forgotten all about in Perth where a guy pulled a gun in the audience. That, that was memorable mm. <laughs> for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Turned out to be a fake gun or one that wasn't working. And sheer coincidence, that guy was here in my town four days ago and he was shit scared to meet me. <laughs> uh, so the God, same I guy. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> yeah, the same guy. He was a mate of the – I'm in a band and it's the Cliffy the guitarist, he's from Perth and that's where it happened and over in Western Australia. And the guy's come to visit. He's come to visit. And, got, and it just happened to be the same fucking guy that pulled a gun on us in Perth. Yeah. We we got him backstage. The bouncers got him backstage, and for some reason we didn't we let him go. He was in a band. He was in bands, and he was, it was some weird sort of. See, we weren't very like. Just going back to that old thing, we weren't very cool. <laughs> 
and to a band, to a lot of bands and musos. Um, we used to get a lot of shit put on us, really, but that's what made us strong, yeah. So he was just sort of mocking us, but we decided not to charge him, that's right? right. Yeah, so we, that's what happened, yeah, we let wasn't him go. it? So he got away yeah. with it. He got away with I it. I mean, that's. I was going to chuck him in the river. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit frightening. Yeah. It, you, you know, Australian Crawl is a, a national institution, um, as I've come to learn. Mm. Most of you have been on the record saying, you know, we, we got very, very close to breaking internationally, but it, it just didn't happen. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what you think the reasons were for that? And I mean, obviously, not that you didn't break internationally, but maybe not to the level you, you hoped for. It's difficult to say, isn't it, Bill? There's a couple mm. of, there's a lot of, a lot of excuses um, that you hear. Um, we, not for lack of trying, but I, I think there was a moment um, when we lost Guy, mm. that was a gut, it just like a knife in the stomach to the band. Right. If you look at the band as a, as a whole, um, I thought that that point of time when, when Guy passed away, the whole chemistry of the band imploded. And certain powers saw I wanted to take over. And um, there was a, there was, when Guy was actually still alive but in hospital, we got an offer to do a tour with Duran Duran in America. It was 78 cities and Canada as well, all the size of Melbourne or Sydney or, um, you know, big urban centres. Um, and we were actually in the Billboard charts. We were in American charts. We were getting press from Billboard. Um, we were getting played in various radio stations in different areas. Like Texas was really keen on us. Um, some certain parts of California were like coastal, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there was this thing about, um, breaking in, like we, we got some American management and lawyers, like lawyer would come over to talk to you to talk about join, get, joining some, um, Matola who was Hall and Oates manager, um, they were interested. They actually came over and saw us at a surf sort of pub. Um, and there was sort of, it, it, we had to pay him about the, the lawyer, like about 30 grand just to say hello. <laughs> and it, like, it seemed like there's a lot of payola shit going on, you know, like, uh, you know, he, yeah, there's a lot of that. And, and there was this stuff about um, in those early eighties, there was things like, there was the understanding of an Australian accent across America. There was even Australian TV shows with subtitles, <laughs> wasn't there? Mm. You know, because they couldn't understand the Australian accent. Uh, and that was an excuse. Like, well, we don't – even that was in Australia, though. A lot of people couldn't understand. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't shock me, though, that the music translated and then transcended to a degree because, you know, as you talked about – the. It is Australian Crawl is a surf band, but there's actually some very substantive songs in in there. You know where you're talking about consumerism and 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 you know toxic masculinity and and all, all sorts of things that even to this day are very very powerful. Mm. That's, yeah, that's yeah. great. That's one thing about one thing about you guys with the lyrics they were quite universal. Hey, and, and had an ambiguity about them. I, they felt personal, but they. You know. Yeah, I, see, um, yeah. I agree with Paul. I think the key to, and this is not to diminish James Rain's input, which was absolutely vital in the early days. I mean, if we didn't have James Rain writing those hit songs and being that enigmatic front man, um, we wouldn't have cracked it in, in Australia. So he was integral to our success in our home territory and in New Zealand. But then when it came to the overseas marketplaces, uh, I think the key to the band's success was Guy. Guy was, I think, a great songwriter and his vocals um, were superior. And I think he wrote a more internationally accepted type of uh, song, something that was more universal in its application or its interpretation. Uh, and I think, well, the other... Th more emotional, that's mm. for sure. Personally, yeah. Yeah, emo emotional. So yeah. I agree, I agree with Paul. Yeah. I just think that uh, it was terribly bad timing. Guy died right at a time, I think, when 
maybe the band could have gone on the road with Duran Duran in the States and and just kicked in, you know, just got Well, got we said that. no. We said, mm -hmm. yeah. But it didn't happen, yeah. One, it was right at that time. It was right at the time when Guy got really crook. Mm. And um, and it, we said, no, we can't do it without Guy. It was that – that's how we felt about the band, yeah. you know? Mm. And that's why we turned the American tour down. And, if you know, like in life with anything, with the competitions, whatever, there's certain doors that open. Yeah. And if you don't go in that door, they close and you, go, you keep going down the hallway of life and maybe another door will open or, mm. you know. Um, that was one of the ones for Australian Crawl, that if, if we hadn't managed to go over and be the physical entity to that name that we were, we were you know, in the press and in Billboard and that we, that we, were, gener we were generating industry attention. Mm. Um, if we had been part of that, it would have worked because we'd just come back off a, off a tour of England uh, with Duran Duran. Um, the, the Geffen, that was our record company at the time, the Geffen girls came backstage and after us being on stage about 10 times said, your album is in the top 100 now. You should stay here in England and back it up, you know, consolidate it. And if you're here... It will work. But we said, no, we've got an Australian tour. We have to go back. It's all booked. Mm. And that was one of those other yeah. ones. Mm. Like, like you look at you look at NXS and ACDC and bands that have, Australian bands that have made it overseas, they've actually gone over. They've dug their heels in and they've they've lived in those sordid flats for five, you know, five people in a, mm. in a room and stuff. And they've, they've toughed it out, you know, gone through the, mm. all the drinking and alcohol and drugs. And, but they've worked and worked. Mm overseas and that's what the band didn't yeah. do due to and you know what before we talked about that and um you know when we did the third album in the states with mike chapman the sons of beach of our Al sons of beaches yeah. album which we mm. recorded in hawaii um on the north shore there with mike and then yeah. we went to la and did the mix in hollywood I remember trying to persuade the band then to stay in the States and start from the bottom, just move over, yeah. get ourselves some houses, bring the girlfriends if they'd yeah. come and just basically start again from scratch. But, again, we were so huge in Australia and New Zealand that um, the lure of touring and money and everything like that just we just got us back. To Australia. Mm. Yeah, that's right. It would have been a, a big grind again yeah, for sure. But I reckon it would have worked. And whether the band might have survived yeah. that. I think it would have too. Yeah, mm. for sure. But but as you said, Paul, like, you know, these are sort of the sliding doors moments and in a lot of ways, like, mm. you know, going back and touring in Australia arguably could have been the better thing. You, you know, Bill, you mentioned James Rain before, mm. and I think it's appropriate because this year actually marks the 40th anniversary of Sirocco, mm. um, which was uh, w a fantastic album of Australian Crawl, came out in uh, 1981. Mm. Can you give us some background on, you know, the writing of this original album at the time versus the remastering process of it right now? Uh, well, yeah. Um We'd had such an enormous success with The Boys Light Up and particularly James became very concerned about his ability as a writer to repeat that success. And that's where Guy came in. And Guy penned, um, you know, almost half that record, including all three singles. And so it was those classic hits that he wrote, Things Don't Seem, uh, Errol, yeah, Errol. classic. Mm. I've got to tell you about the Errol film clip yeah. too because that's got a real surf history thing. Uh, yeah, so, you know, again, I think tremendous input from Guy. Um, but Guy brought the sound of the beach to that, to the yeah, band actually. Yeah. He, he brought the feel, he brought the soul of the, of the, of the yeah. beach to the the, that album for sure. Some of his lyrics, Resort yeah, Girls. Um, yeah, and those, you know, the, the, yeah, the three singles, mm. particularly first two, just just the album went straight to number one. It sold quadruple platinum out of the stores day one, two hundred thousand. 
Yeah. So what, what was the story with the Errol, Errol music video, Bill? Oh, right. Okay. Well, Guy, I remember Guy riding Errol. He was living in this little country shack down here on the Mornington Peninsula over at a place called Somerville. And he was sitting on his bed and he said, hey, Bill, I have a listen to this. And he's played me this track and I've just gone, oh, fuck me, that's a hit. And um, so anyway, <laughs> it, got, it got included uh, and, of course, it became the second single off the album and our record company at the time, EMI, said, right, we're going to do a film clip for this. So we engaged a guy called George Muskins, who is an old school friend, an old band friend, uh, who was uh, a filmmaker out of um, the Gold Coast in Queensland. So we flew up to the Gold Coast and George did this epic film clip of us surfing. It was all water stuff, uh, slalom skiing at, uh, what's that name of that, SeaWorld. And if you look mm. at the... They had the underwater camera, yeah, if you, didn't they? If you look at the Coca Cola ad, yeah. Bit. If you look at the, you know, like we're talking underwater live in, and it was the guy that did all that camera work was the legendary um, surf icon and innovator and film cameraman, a guy called George Greeno. He was an American. Have you heard of him? Oh yeah, oh, of yeah, course. yeah. Like he's he, the guy hugely that, influential. Yeah, yeah. Like he was the guy that invented fins, I believe. He was the guy that. Uh, started shaping boards, going for the short, small board with the dished out bottom and putting fins That's right. in. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. the knee boards, yeah. yeah. And um, he was up with McTavish and, and those guys at Noosin in the early 60s. He was a knee board rider. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't a stand-up yep. rider. Mm. And he did all that mm. film cameraman stuff. You, you should have a look at it. It's some, some really great footage. And... Just think about it. It's all water. Every yeah. shot is is mm. water. Oh, except isn't it? except like, for except, the girl yeah. ones. The, yes. Ah, oh, but that's in a star. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now this is this is a cool statistic. Every every pr- uh, lovely young lady in that film clip, Dave, <laughs> was was oh, a no. um, a Playboy bunny, a Playboy bunny centerfold. All penthouse. All no, both. no, Playboy. Because mm. penthouse mm. was a bit too, Playboy, bit too um, yeah. racy, Paul. Yeah, but um, yeah, have a look at that Errol film clip. It's really cool. And Paul surfing, and guys surfing. Great, yeah, great. And guys on the same yeah. wave. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I've, uh, and Brad yeah, surfing. He dropped in on me. Um, and I'm water skiing. Brad surf. Yeah, excellent yeah. water skiing. What about that big spray across the camera in slow mo? Well, I almost yes. cut Greeno's head off with the skeg because <laughs> I was That's I was about right. that far off him when I laid it right over on my right <laughs> shoulder, my left shoulder, and and it pushed right out. That's right across the wake. You had the um, you had the Bondi chest. <laughs> yeah, far from ma- far from manly. <laughs> Sorry, Aussie joke there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's when you had the bod. You had the and, yeah from all that years uh, of drumming. You were and, built. Oh, that was that was uh, being a um, competitive swimmer. And but one thing, like what strikes me is how the the film clip clip starts with with the shot of the sun coming through in slow mo yeah. of a wave. So it's golden mm. and the waves curving over in mm. slow mo. And Errol just suited that moment gorgeously. There's something. Mm. It linked, oh, yeah, didn't it? Right. Subliminally, there's something it, it linked. Mm. Yeah. Quickly. Well, and it's it, it's such a beautiful kind of symmetry with you know, even talking about it and the influence that you've had on surf culture and the influence that surf culture's had on Australian crawl. I, I, I mm. am wondering, you know, now that you're a podcast star, is bona fide <laughs> after your first attempt. <laughs> You, you know, w- w- <laughs> is there a potential reunion for Australian Crawl? We're coming back to Bell's Beach next year. Like, can we get you guys back for the for the end end of end of event party? That'll never happen, and it'll not as a band. It'll never happen, and the reason why it will no. never happen no. is because <laughs> James Rain will never do it. There's blood on yeah, the tracks. There's blood on the tracks. Yeah. he'll never do let's, it. Let's let's. Let's shame him into it. Let's just do it right now. Come on, James. <laughs> no, he won't. Do I, I think maybe maybe we can we can we can on ramp him. We get everyone there to enjoy it. We can play, you know, reckless and the boys light up and the Sirocco hits like you know, and and we, we get you guys going. We get you gassed up, and then the year after we're we're live, baby. Yeah. Well, look, 
You know what? Uh, it, you can give it a try. It, look, give it a try. You can ask. You can it's always pretty, ask. It's going to be. It's you almost know. impossible. And I'll tell you why. Because I mean, never say never. Though, no, boy. no. But see, guys dead and Brad's dead, so we've lost two members. That's you know? right. And. and and, si- and, and, yeah. and Simon, uh, not too many people know this, but Simon um, had a terrible car accident many years ago and that's given him um, a, uh, an injury. So, you know, we're not... And we're all in our late 60s. Mm. It, yes. Yeah. I can't party for more than three yeah. hours now before I need a little oh, lie down. I think it's going to be hard. It's not <laughs> impossible, Most of the- but it could be hard. M- most of the surfers on tour can't do more than three hours now anyway, so I think you're in good shape. But, but I, do, I do think, like, it, it's, been, it's been such a joy to, uh, to talk to you both. And, and, and I mean, the, the impact you've made just on surf culture is, is, is invaluable, right? And, and I think for all of our listeners, you know, make sure everyone checks out the 40th anniversary of the remastered edition of Australian Crawl's album, Sirocco, and you can listen to it on all streaming platforms or via the link in the episode description for this episode. But Bill and Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. This was, this was a personal honour of mine to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Dave. It's been great. Yeah, actually. my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great.